Okay, uh, good morning or afternoon to everybody, uh, wherever you may be on Turtle Island. My name is Mark Sylvester, and I'm the founding, a founding member and senior advisor to the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association. I'm the general manager of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation Community Trust and an advisory board me member uh, to the First Peoples Worldwide Organization. I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today on aligning your investments with, our, with your community values and long-term goals. Over the next hour, we will explore strategies to ensure that your community's assets are invested and stewarded in ways that incorporate your community's traditional and cultural values. This webinar supports the launch of our latest publication, uh, Investing for Today, Tomorrow and Future Generations, a guide for Indigenous investors. And this is brought to you by, our, by us and your friends at the Reconciliation and Responsible Investment Initiative. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that my RRII colleagues and panelists uh, are joining us today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I'm joining you from the banks of the historic Grand River here in southern Ontario, live from the Six Nations of the Grand River First Nation Territory. We're so grateful to have participants joining us from across Turtle Island and beyond today. So to start, I'd like to offer some background on the Reconciliation Responsible Investment Initiative and the speakers who put this webinar and this great work together. Uh, the RRII is a partnership between NATOA, National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association, and SHARE Canada. Uh, we work with Indigenous communities, generally through trust boards, as well as uh, Canadian in institutional investors to promote Indigenous values-based responsible investment procedures and practices that include reconciliation goals for the non-Indigenous investors. We believe that together, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous investors can build capital markets that integrate and better align with Indigenous values, rights, and ways of knowing. So to introduce our speakers today, we have Shannon Rohan, the Chief Strategy Officer at Share Canada. We have Mike Bonshore, President and CEO of Vision First Nations Financial Services and Kamola Indigenous Capital, and now Managing Director of the First Nations Business Development Association. And taking care of us today uh, is Katie Wheatley. She is our project lead for the Reconciliation Responsible Investment initiatives. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here and joining us and I'll turn it over to Katie to show us show us the way. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so before we jump in, a few quick housekeeping matters. So we're keen to make this an interactive experience. You can send us questions um, through the chat box in the lower half of the GoToWebinar panel at any time. And towards the end of the webinar, we'll open up the discussion and look to address any questions that have come in in the meantime. At that point, you'll also be able to directly ask us questions via microphone by clicking on the hand icon within the webinar panel. We can then activate your channel so that everyone can hear the question. Please also note that we are recording this webinar to make it available on our website at reconciliationandinvestment.ca. Now I'd like to hand it off to Mike Bonshore, who will speak to how First Nations teachings and values relate to wealth and the governance of trusts and other collective financial assets. Thanks, Katie. Um, thanks for the the intro, Katie, and uh, your opening remarks, uh, Mark. Um, in I guess in thinking about this topic and, and leading up to this workshop, uh, and you know the issue of how we incorporate our values into our sort of wealth management practices and structures. Um, I got thinking that, you know, I think it's, it can be a challenging exercise. And I think, and I, and I wonder that if it's, if it part of it stems from where we start in that, uh, I think I could be wrong, but I think for the most part, we generally start with sort of the mainstream approaches and the mainstream sort of documents and tools that we were sort of brought to us and we try to fit in our values into that. And I think I think maybe what is another opportunity is to instead start with our community values, getting an, an understanding of those community values. And from there, 
we build in the necessary tools and practices and structures that can make that happen. So we're not totally driven by, because you know, I've heard from community trustees that you know part of the challenges they have is working in and around their trust agreement. And I think that's, you know, to me, provides evidence that, you know, maybe if we start from, if we start from a different point, if we start from our own perspective, that th this can, you know, that, um, or even restart from our own perspective, it can make the exercise uh, a lot easier and a lot more relevant and uh, useful to ourselves. And, um, you know, the, the document that's been, uh, the paper that was prepared has a lot of great examples of uh, community examples of, of values that are being instilled and incorporated into uh, communities wealth management um, um, approaches you know we're I think there's a lot of commonality amongst our amongst our people in terms of respect for you know future generations caring for all members of our community looking to the long term respect for their our lands and resources and our and their territory and, the, and those are are common threads that we can use as a as a starting point as, a, as opposed to trying to wedge it in into documentation and approaches that may not be entirely familiar to us uh, um, I shared in the I shared in the paper um, uh, my family's experience in potlatching and uh, I was you know, honored to be able to to share that and obviously honored to be able to participate in, in our families in our, our family's work there and what I guess the reason why we I put that into the the document was that it's kind of an example of our historical and ongoing wealth management practices. In that, you know, where things may be different now, we're, we're still, uh, you know, the underlying principles are I think are still the same in terms of how we go about that family business in terms of, you know, honoring our past and and our family's connection to the lands and resources and our territory, you know, providing for the community acquiring wealth and sharing that wealth with the community and and respecting leadership and i think we can we can learn from those examples learn from those principles in our wealth management practices um, i think it's easy to get lost in the sort of the details of um, um, trust agreements and uh, um, other other you know our um, investment policies and practices um, documents and so on and I think if we you know if we stick to those core principles and focus in on positive community outcomes it can make a real impactful difference in in the work that we do um, you know as well as you know there's the, the paper outlines a uh, as I mentioned a number of really strong, uh, community value statements and principles that, that different groups are following, like like Marx. Um, I think is I think equally important, uh, along with capturing your values into your your management uh, documents. I think it's really important to to develop the necessary practices to ensure that those values are upheld. And in a way that is that makes sense for your your community, and I think the the uh, the paper speaks to a lot of uh, useful ideas around you know exercising your rights as shareholders, you know positive and, and negative screening on your investments, but I think just basically just a a make sure you have regular reviews of your investment impacts um, beyond just financial reviews, looking at uh, not just the returns, but looking at where your investment dollars are going and what kind of impact they are having and do, do those impacts feel right with your community, I think is, is a key thing. And the last thing I guess I would add to, to, the, to my part of the conversation is uh, advocating for where it's possible, and I think it's probably possible in most instances, is a sort of an integrated governance model in your wealth management practices. Um, your, it's a being a trustee is a tough job, but I think it's it's better enabled when you can lean on and get the support of your chief and council, uh, integrate the planning of your development corporation in your community, and so that everyone is, has a good understanding of where what you're working towards collectively as a community, because um, I think that can have a positive community impact in the in the long run. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, um, Thanks for the opportunity to participate and I look forward to the, the conversation moving forward from here.
I'll let Kesla. Great, thank you so much for that, Mike. That's really, really helpful in kind of grounding this conversation. Um, Mark, I'll turn it over to you now to tell us a bit more about uh, some of the key ideas or principles that the guide that Mike had mentioned and that you noted at the top, um, this is helping to launch, that the, the key principles outlined uh, around good trust governance. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, a great part of the, the document that we've created, and we've identified six key principles uh, that will uh, aid in the governance uh, of the of your trust and and your invested funds. So a lot of the governing documents that uh, you utilize uh, should include a lot of these principles, and, uh, and I'll just run through them quickly for you. Uh, the first principle is the purpose, the purpose of why you are establishing a trust or and or investing the funds from that trust uh, are critical. Um, you, you are looking at, and this is a way that you can include the values of your community, who your community is and why you're doing it, whether it's a, an education trust or a treaty land entitlement trust where you're purchasing land, uh, uh, an economic development trust or just a general trust for your community uh, a lot of those the purpose of the of this will go a long way in the governance of it uh, goes into what mike was talking about an asset selection um, that is consistent with your communities the second principle is stewardship uh, you are responsible to your uh, beneficiaries for the assets that you are uh, entrusted with and responsible for. So your responsibility goes a long way to show and have an impact within your community. Uh, the next principle ties into that, it's fiduciary duty. Uh, we hear that word, uh, that term all the time. And generally what that means is you're, you're uh, upholding the responsibilities to benefit your, your beneficiaries. Uh, you have to act with a duty of loyalty and a duty of care and you have to put their needs first, not your own. You have to uh, ensure that you are making your decisions based on what's the best interest for your community. Uh, and in that, we've had a lot of discussion on um, is fiduciary duty the highest level we owe? How does our traditional values and our cultural values play into that? So I'll, I will let you know um, that uh, we at the RRII are doing some work with uh, uh, a very highly respected uh, uh, Indigenous legal professional named jo Dr. John Burroughs at the uh, University of Victoria and through a, a student of his and his work, uh, we are developing a, a, a position paper on the Indigenous fiduciary. So that's going to be uh, extremely helpful for us uh, because moving forward, our fourth principle is accountability. So how does our work as a fiduciary for our people how do we show accountability back to our community? How do we take into account, um, you know, more than just a financial return on our invested funds? How do we, you know, as as we're going to be talking about in a, in a little bit in this uh, webinar and a lot of the work that we're doing, how is our responsibility as a shareholder uh, impact a lot of the companies that we own? Can, do, can we have an impact? And we have some examples, great examples, uh, even recently, and uh, and you know and surely we'll be talking about some recent events that have shown the power of the shareholder voice with to to encourage uh, social social change. Um, the next uh, key principle is transparency. Uh, this is this is talking about how we are uh, sharing our informa information with our beneficiaries, with our communities, uh, and really what we're doing is trying to look for feedback and input from them to ensure that the values that we initially uh, say we are espousing and, and, and building our uh, our um, trusts and investments based are based on uh, are actually doing what we want them to do and having the impact within the community that we're hoping to have so uh, the transparency is the sharing of the information back and forth with our community members uh, and finally our last principle is suitability uh, we're trying to ensure that all parties involved in the trust should have the necessary experience, skills, knowledge needed for their positions. And in this case, this is where uh, 
my organization, the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association, can come in incredibly handy and helpful with our online training programs, our conferences, our, our uh, information, the contacts, the networks that we have, uh, certainly will be able to help uh, create a, a situation where we are helping to, you know, it's the purpose of why we started NATO in the fir first place, was to share stories, create capacity, build education, and work as advocates for um, those of us who are in this Indigenous investment and trust community. So uh, with that in, also I'll, I'll add just in closing on this part that uh, our, our, as Mike mentioned, our document does provide some uh, examples of this. Uh, we have a, a, a case study in there with Carcross Tigish First Nation, Carcross Tigish First Nation, uh, who in, in incorporating these six principles that I've just gone over, they've added their traditional values. The, the, their guiding policy sets forth that their trust must be administered with integrity, selflessness, honor, respect, courage, and knowledge. So when you refer to your own community's specific values, it, it will go a long way to providing information for the service providers uh, who are generally uh, non-Indigenous um, but it, it gives them a great sense of who you are and, and what they're doing on your behalf. Um, so, you know, I encourage everybody to get a hold of our, do, our, our guide and, and, and take a look and, and please uh, share your stories with us because I think this is a way that will help us continue this work and uh, get more and more examples of how our various communities are approaching this, uh, uh, this shared thing that we do. So I'll give that back to uh, Katie. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for providing that overview of some of the key principles that um, have ident been identified over time as really viable um, posts around which we can ensure good governance of the trusts that everyone is entrusted with overseeing. Um, I'll look to Shannon now to introduce the five ma major strategies that we have outlined to align investments with community values and long-term goals. Okay, thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people joining us today. Um, and, and it's great to be here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mike and, and Katie. Um, through this guide, um, you know, in addition to setting those five key governance principles that Mark just I outlined, we also wanted to establish some recommendations or steps that Indigenous investors can consider taking in terms of um, aligning their investments more closely uh, with their values and, and their broader community aspirations. Um, and in the process of bringing this guide together, I really do want to recognize that we had a number of different contributors um, who really helped to um, provide us with case studies, provide us with insights and wisdom. Um, those contributors are listed in the guide. Mike Bonshore is, is, is one of those. Jason Campbell, who uh, it has been a key player in the Reconciliation Responsible Investment Initiative, uh, is also a contributor. Stephen Nairn, who's the Chief Investment Officer at Raven Indigenous Capital Partners, uh, is another contributor. Um, Megan Shannon, uh, who is the Senior Manager of Indigenous Markets uh, at CIBC and now also a member of the board at NATOA, uh, provided some great insights. Uh, Shapela Matsiam, uh, otherwise known as Chief uh, Hereditary Chief Lian Zhou from the Squamish Nation, uh, made some contributions that were very helpful. And finally, Vicki Whitehead, who's the Director of Indigenous Services uh, at Crow McKay, um, who has always been so helpful and insightful to uh, the RRII. So I just wanted to, to call those people out. What we want to do now is move into looking at into a bit further depth what these five steps are and you'll see them now on on the screen here but the first is really embedding those values into the investment policy statement the second um, you know working effectively with asset managers what are some ways um, we can ensure closer alignment with the service providers that we work with um, the third step is really around knowing what you own um, and so understanding what is uh, in your portfolio, what makes up uh, your different investments across asset classes. Um, the fourth is using your voice. So rather than sort of just being a passive investor, looking at how you can use your rights 
uh, as investors and use your voice as an investor um, to talk about the things that matter to, to your community. Uh, and finally, investing in the Indigenous economy, um, investing in your own community, investing in Indigenous communities and businesses across the country and, and, and identifying ways that we can do that. So those are the five steps we're going to go through now. Um, and I just want to uh, talk a little bit about this first step in terms of embedding values into uh, your investment policy. And I think um, Mike uh, really set this up quite nicely in his introductory remarks. And, and that's really what is the starting place or the restarting place, as he said. And that's really looking at what are those values um, and, and what, you know, in terms of investment, how do we embed those values into the way that we're making investment. And as you know, the investment policy statement is a key governance document um, for trusts, and it really uh, provides the overarching framework for the management of the trust's investment assets. Um, so the investment policy assigns roles and responsibilities to the different um, external and internal actors. Um, it clarifies what your object, uh, investment objectives are and your goals. Um, it identifies the asset mix uh, and articulates your risk tolerance um, and return objectives. Um, and it also establishes other criteria to review and evaluate um, the investments that are held. And so one of the recommendations we make in the guide is to consider incorporating a statement of community values or beliefs into your investment policy. And what this statement uh, of values or beliefs can do is it can really support sound decision making uh, and helps trustee boards uh, to work effectively with external service providers, for example. So you have a clear, explicit set of statements or beliefs around your values, and that can really help initiate an important conversation with the different service providers that you're working with. Um, you know, the statement uh, sort of connecting back into those governance principles should outline the purpose of the trust um, and the community's aims, their beliefs and their values regarding those financial assets and, and the approach to investing. And so I want to actually turn it back to Mark because um, he has a, a specific experience uh, with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation Community Trust and the steps that they took to do this. Um, on the screen in front of me here, you'll see another example from the Oneida Trust um, and, and how they uh, try to incorporate their cultural and spiritual values into their uh, investment policy. So Mark, I'll turn it over to you um, and just if you could talk a little bit about the process that you went through uh, with your trust. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. A, a lot of the work that uh, began this was the work that uh, I've been doing with Shannon and her team at SHARE um, and recognize, and reviewing our own investment policy statement at the time. There was absolutely nothing in there that indicated who the, who our trust was and, and why they were investing. Um, and and in a, you know, in a, in a, I'll give you a quick example of a brief experience that we had a, a couple of years ago we uh, had retained a new investment manager and going through the, you know, the, the, the proper uh, Ontario Securities Commission get to know your forms that your investment manager sends to you. There was absolutely no section in there that asked you, who are you and why are you investing? They asked the standard stuff. How much money is it? How long are you going to invest it for? What are your risk tolerances? Um, and you know how much how much of the capital do you need or the uh, do you need at various times throughout you know what is the duration some very technical terms but there was absolutely nothing in there that says where does this money come from who is investing it and what is the purpose of of investing the, these funds and so you know in, in doing this work we recognized that we had to put in a a, a statement within our investment policy statement that um, and as i mentioned before uh, generally speaking, the uh, investment industry that we deal with are, are non-Aboriginal uh, professionals that we deal with. Wonderful people, but the, what we were really trying to do is take a cultural and a traditional value and articulate it in a way that turns into an investment decision. So uh, instead of uh, trying to explain each and every one. We want to give a general idea of who we are so that our investment manager can make a decision on an investment that 
meets the goals and needs uh, of the community. So in our case, when I was doing the research, and, and I'm a Six Nations Mohawk, I am not a Mississauga and an Anishinaabe person. So I think my board was sort of expecting me to draw this up. And in the research I had to do is I, 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 I you know, connected with the chief and, and some of the counselors and said, who are you as a people? Where have you articulated um, the, the values of this particular community? And I was directed to their a uh, comprehensive community plan that they had just developed uh, within a, a few years prior and they have a, a value statement within that and so that's what I used and I'll, and I'll just give you a quick read through what, what it says. It says the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation look to our Anishinaabe roots to guide our vision for our future as a strong, caring, connected membership who respects the earth's gifts and protects the environment for future generations. Our identity uh, our identity includes our history, language, culture, beliefs, traditions, which we strive to incorporate into the programs and services offered to our membership. So what we are truly really trying to say here is that, you know, this is who these people are. And we would really uh, want to articulate that to our investment managers so that they can um, ensure that in their decisions, they have something to go by to say these are the who these people are and that factors into helping uh, provide them some guidance on on the decision so this is where this becomes a valuable tool to to be able to help uh, our communities invest in a way that is consistent with their cultural and traditional values back to you shannon Great, thank you, Mark. And I think that is a, a great segue into um, the second sort of step or recommendation that we um, make in the guide. And that's really around um, the way in which that we work effectively with asset managers um, and, and the way we hire managers, the way we monitor and evaluate them. Um, as you know, the criteria used for hiring and, and monitoring asset managers is primarily based on, on the firm's investment skill, um, their approach uh, to investing and how that aligns with your investment objectives, um, and of course their financial uh, performance and investment performance. And, and this is you know, much along the lines of what Mike said in his introductory comments. This is how it generally hiring and evaluating investment managers has always been done. It's the way that, you know, uh, you know, this is a model that um, is replicated across different asset owner groups, uh, including, in, you know, uh, universities or pension funds, you know, these are the kinds of things they're looking at. Um, but how do we know that that suitability uh, is there in terms of our asset managers? And, and how do we bring in conversations about values and beliefs, um, knowledge of Indigenous history, um, in the degree to which the investment management firm has looked at, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and the calls to action and the degree to which they're taking steps internally as an organization to align uh, with those, those recommendations. And I think those are conversations that um, are really important, um, particularly for Indigenous investors to have with their managers. Um, and so in the guide, you'll see that um, we have some recommendations, we have some sample questions that you can ask um, that are shown here. Does the asset manager consider the impacts of corporate practices uh, on Indigenous communities, territories, land and water as part of their investment decision making, for example? Um, has the asset manager advanced awareness with its, within its own organization of Indigenous history, culture, and the legacy of res residential schools? Um, and, and so these are some of the questions that I think are, are really important for clients and, and potential clients to be asking of their investment managers, in addition to the other questions and, and, and sort of criteria that you already have in place in terms of their their overall performance in terms of their investment approach. Um, so, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the recommendations in the guide in terms of really trying to improve that alignment with your asset managers. Um, so I will turn it uh, over to um, Katie at this point, who's going to talk about um, uh, some of the next steps that we recommend in the guide. Great, thanks, Shannon. So we're going to move now to step three, which is around asset selection. And we sometimes refer to this as knowing what you own. 
like other institutional investors, trusts, and other indigenous investors um, invest often the majority, but definitely a large part of their portfolios in the shares of Canadian and global companies and in corporate bonds. Recognizing broader community values can lead investors to look more closely at what is in their portfolio and as a result, potentially adjust that portfolio. So this strategy, asset selection, can be divided into two primary approaches, which would be screening and thematic investments. Um, investors use positive screening as a way to encourage investments in certain sectors or companies. For instance, your community might want to ensure that it is investing in companies with a good record of pollution control. Concerns about specific companies or industries have led some institutional investors to establish criteria to direct their managers to exclude certain companies or industries from their portfolios. So we've seen, for instance, religious investors screen out companies that conflict with their values, such as those involved in weapons manufacturing. And we're seeing universities increasingly divest from fossil fuels. Thematic and impact investments are investments that seek to deliver positive social and environmental outcomes alongside different levels of financial returns. So you could choose, for instance, thematic investments to target companies that might be developing renewable energy or that might be trying to improve human health. If you choose to consider a screen or a thematic investment, you would likely want to speak directly with community members to determine issues or themes that are important to them, where they would feel comfortable having investments or would prefer to avoid investments. And you can talk with your investment consultants and managers to understand what assets are currently being held, as well as what opportunities might be available to you. We're also seeing some large sovereign wealth funds, such as Norway, set ethical guidelines for the kinds of companies that they will invest in and will not invest in. So Norway is a good example of this. Um, their trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund has made headlines as it has sold, sold off billions of dollars of shares from coal and energy companies, complementing these negative screens as we would call them on fossil fuels are positive screens focusing on investing in green infrastructure and renewables. And we're seeing some indigenous trusts choose to make these types of decisions as well. One example of this can be seen at the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. Their Thunderbird Trust is governed by an investment policy statement that says, investment decisions must be in keeping with the nation's values. It requires that investment managers restrict asset allocation to companies that are socially responsible. The Thunderbird Trust also excludes investments in companies involved in tobacco, alcohol, and or pornography. If anyone is on the line from the Chippewas of the Thames, we would really welcome your comments or um, additions at the end of the session too. Keep in mind though that buying or selling shares in a company is but one of several approaches that you can take. This brings us to strategy four around investor stewardship. This is about using your voice as an investor to influence corporate policies and practices. So there are two key ways to steward your investments. The first would be proxy voting. The voting rights attached to public equities are valuable assets and you can ensure that your votes are being cast in your long-term interests by developing or revising your own proxy voting guidelines. Coast Funds, which is an Indigenous-led conservation finance organization that supports First Nations across the Great Bear Rainforest and Haida Gwaii, did just that in recent years. Coast Funds developed a new set of guidelines to provide asset managers with specific direction around how their voting rights should be cast, particularly around votes relating to the rights of Indigenous peoples, which do come up on the ballot. Our last webinar, which we held in late April, covered proxy voting in greater depth, and you can find a recording of that on our website. The second major part of investor stewardship is shareholder engagement. So this practice sees investors leverage their position as shareholders in public companies to improve corporate decision-making. Uh, this can occur through letter writing, face-to-face -face meetings with company management or directors, or filing shareholder resolutions at annual meetings and effective engagement is not confrontational, it's based on constructive dialogue that aims to build more successful companies and ultimately create better outcomes, not just for the company, um, but also for communities, the environment, and future generations. 
SHARE leads a shareholder engagement program. And this year we focused on indigenous rights and reconciliation, decent work and human rights, water security, and the climate transition. Mark, would you mind telling us a bit about a recent situation where we saw constructive engagement really make the difference in the US context? Yeah, absolutely. And if you notice up here, the foot, former football guy gets the football question. So the uh, the recent uh, developments with the Washington NFL franchise, where uh, for many, many decades, uh, Indigenous and Native American advocates had been uh, advocating for the name change based on their view that it's a, it was a racist and derogatory term. Uh, Monday, you'll notice that uh, the team, in fact, uh, decided to retire the name and they're looking to change it to something else. Um, realistically, with uh, with what was going on in the United States based on uh, social um, upheaval, based on the unfortunate passing of, uh, of George Floyd, uh, created a, an opportunity that, um, you know, really focused on uh, uh, you know, discrimination and racism. And, and this was one way that, uh, and, and as I mentioned, I'm on the advisory board of First Peoples Worldwide and they're connected with SHARE, uh, a, a lot of the work that they had done was coordinating a shareholder uh, pressure upon Federal Express, Nike and Pepsi um, to to say, you know, at, and, and, and a significant amount, it was $620 billion worth of shareholders uh, uh, you know, making their voices known to these companies that their connection with this team, with that name uh, is uh, incredibly wrong and, and, and something should be done. And, you know, and quite realistically, the owner had been on record saying he was never going to change the name. He thought it was a First Amendment issue for, issue for him. Uh, but when he recognized that uh, his uh, future viability uh, and profitability moving forward with that name at this time was just something he could not uh, change. So uh, a lot of our advocates said, you know, I don't care how it gets done, but it got done. And I will uh, you know, let you know that we've actually in initiated the same sort of protocol uh, with the Edmonton context. So uh, we will see what happens, but uh, you know, this, this is good news and this is a, a powerful impact on uh, a shareholder advocacy. And if I just have a quick second here too, uh, we did one recently as well with Scotiabank uh, with a, a shareholder proposal that was brought forward. We supported it. Uh, unfortunately, the shareholder proposal was, uh, was declined during the annual general meeting, but uh, Katie and I, after this meeting, have a, an engagement with the uh, with Scotiabank to have a very open dialogue about why we supported it and have a discussion move it forward. So hopefully good things will happen. Great, thanks Mark. So I should also note that before I hand it back to Shannon to tell us about the fifth and final strategy that through the Reconciliation and Responsible Investment Initiative, uh, we've established an engagement program called Values in Action. And we are preparing to invite an additional three trusts this year to participate in that program to experience shareholder engagement um, in a broader community um, free for a year. So if you are at a trust that would be interested in participating, please feel free to get in touch with any of us to um, help make that come to life. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, I just want to remind folks we're sort of coming to the end of the part of this webinar where we're talking at you um, and we're going to be opening it up to questions. And so just to remind folks that you do have um, the ability to type questions in, uh, in the panel on the right hand side, um, there should be a, a section called questions. So please um, start bringing your questions in so we can get them in the queue. Um, and you can also raise your hand. So I do see some people do have hands raised and we will um, unmute you and allow you the opportunity to uh, ask your questions that way. So um, we do hope that um, folks will have a, a opportunity to have a more interactive conversation. Um, so I just want to get people lined up and ready for that. But first, just looking at the fifth um, recommendation that we make in the guide, and that's really around investing uh, in the Indigenous economy um, uh, and learning about new and emerging opportunities that are out there um, 
in Canada uh, to invest uh, in the Indigenous economy. And we know from our work with um, Indigenous trusts that there is interest um, in the ability to do this. Um, of course, there are various challenges and, uh, um, and, and some barriers um, to, to doing this, but um, there are really a growing number of viable opportunities for trusts to invest in products and funds that aim to contribute to the growth of a vibrant uh, and resilient Indigenous economy. Um, uh, and these opportunities may form an important part of a multi-asset strategy aligned with your trust's risk return and liquidity objectives. So we encourage people to to continue to educate themselves and uh, invite folks to talk about these different opportunities. Um, some of the opportunities that we identify in the guide and that are listed here um, are First Nations Finance Authority has a, a fixed income product, a, a bond product um, that is available. Um, the Raven Indigenous Impact Fund uh, is another great opportunity and uh, is profiled uh, in the guide. Um, NACA and, and its Indigenous Growth Fund um, is coming online and that'll support the ongoing um, debt financing provided through the Aboriginal Financial Institution Network. So that's um, another opportunity to, to keep in mind. Um, and finally, the Kamola Indigenous Capital and, and Visions First Nations Financial Services also has opportunities, particularly um, in the uh, in the in, um, infrastructure and alternative investment space. So those are some of the, the opportunities that we outline. Um, in, in terms of implementation, some of the steps, you know, it's important to explore these investment opportunities um, and ensure that they align with the overall purpose of your investment vehicle and the criteria that you've established in your investment policy. Um, and always when exploring new investment opportunities and new asset classes, it's critical that you feel comfortable and knowledgeable about these options before making decisions. And the general rule that, um, you know, when we're talking to trustee boards that share, if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. So sometimes um, you may be hearing about very complex products or people um, coming to, to present, and it's really critical that you do understand um, you know, the investment product and vehicle before, before investing in it. Um, and so recommend that you look at that part of the guide as well um, uh, and get a sense of some of these emerging opportunities out there. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're going to um, move into questions. And so as I said, um, you can raise your hand, uh, you can type questions in, and we do have a few here. Um, one that's just come through, and um, maybe I'll direct this to Mark and or Mike, and that is around tax efficiency and how important is tax efficiency in the investment goals? Well, if I just jump in quickly, I think that is, that's something that you definitely have to uh, discuss with your investment management and your you know advisors uh, that you're working with. Um, you know, they're practical terms a lot of uh, First Nation trusts um, you know effectively pass that along to the beneficiaries and in our case the beneficiaries are status Indian so there's a bit of a, a break there but it's definitely something that you have to have the discussion with uh, moving forward and, and know where you stand with it. I don't have anything to add that's good that's a good answer. <laughs> okay, uh, other questions um, that people have, please continue to type them in. Um, just looking at any hands up here. Another question maybe um, for you, Mike, that you can um, address is around how do you different teachings, community teachings, relate to the management of these communal communal resources and, and how does this map onto uh, other areas of wealth and wealth management um, for First Nations? Well, I think this is the, the area of wealth governance and wealth management that communities are, are working through 
um, I see it as fitting into the overall construct of the community's governance. And so you're, I mentioned some of the other, some of my family's examples in terms of respecting leadership. However, that leadership um, structure may look like, you know, we have a lot of communities that are, uh, I'm working with a community now that has a hereditary leadership system uh, where they have seven, seven family families that lead the community. And so that's something that they've been doing for, for generations. And so you can see how that, from a structure standpoint, how that can influence how you how you make decisions. Um, and I think if a community is well grounded in its in its um, in its in its in its decision making, that can flow through to how you make decisions, whether it's healthcare related or economic development or or investment management. Um, you know, one thing that uh, um, one issue that I come across quite a bit is, you know, the the issue of or the opportunity to invest for the long term. And I, I appreciate that that's a an important consideration, and it's something that's in a lot of cases hardwired into a community's investment approach. Um, but I think that also has to be measured against the the current community needs, and you know the we have uh, our, and Mark mentioned the, the the beneficiaries of our of our trusts are our members, and we have a young population. We have a young, fast growing population, and I think we need to find that balance between what is needed in the long term versus what is what does the community need now. So I think you know that's one teaching that that I think we need to employ and incorporate, in, incorporate into our decision making about how to meet pressing current community needs uh, that, are, that are out there now versus ensuring that we have resources for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think that is um, the real tricky balancing act in terms of the, the immediate needs, as you're saying, and also thinking um, and investing in a way that thinks about future generations, which is is often very challenging. Um, Mark, I wanted to just um, ask you about your experience in, in the, um, articulating the community value statement as part of your investment policy. And uh, the preceding conversations that you had with your asset managers about that, can you talk about um, you know what those com you know how did those conversations go how did your managers react um you know were there questions about okay how do we actually implement this um any insights in terms of uh, uh the conversations that proceeded with service providers or or anyone actually once you made that adjustment to your investment policy yeah well i think i had the benefit of uh you know working working with you guys at share for sure um, the other part is that you know, our trust is one of, was the first one to join the Values in Action program. So you know, we've got the full weight of uh, information. And I think the most important thing for me was that learning through the SHARE network was uh, you know, in, in connection with religious investors and some of the foundations that uh, they were implementing some of these values-based decision-making and, and setting up. And, and the investment managers were doing it already. So I think it wasn't a stretch for us to say, okay, let's articulate our values and and work with our managers to to implement them and, and to execute them, uh, because it was uh, it, it wasn't something I did in a vacuum. I had discussions with the investment managers. I was telling them this is what the way we wanted to go, uh, and they were quite helpful. I mean, they were giving me some advice on what they needed to hear to see. Because uh, as I stated, it, you're taking a traditional and cultural value and articulating it in a way that turns into an investment decision. So it was some work with uh, with our managers to ensure that you know here's what we were going to produce based on the people who we are, and you know utilize the the the, the language so that they could could change it. And in, 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 you know, and and truthfully, I am developing a further 
uh, investment value statement that I'm working through with my trustees at the moment, that will, which will further articulate and take away any kind of uh, misunderstanding or lack of clarity from the what we've included in our investment policy statement. But it will be something even more defined for our managers. So once we get that uh, up and approved, I'll certainly be willing to share it with uh, with with uh, our with our networks. And so I think it's important. But I think working because as I said, I'm I'm not a Mississauga Anishinaabe person, so I can't just go from personal experience and say these are the teachings I've been given. So I had to work with my trustee board, the chief and council and find out from them who they are and how they view things because a lot of times indigenous is uh, sometimes uh, homogenous there's a, a lot of similarities but when you're talking about very each community there are some very specifics very specific things that uh, uh, relate specifically to them and i think it's important for each group to be able to articulate that in a way that uh, a non-indigenous person can um, can then understand and, and make a decision on their behalf, which is in their best interest. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good point, that that process of understanding what the specific teachings and traditions are that are relevant and you want to be at the centre uh, of the conversations with the trust is really important. And I'll just add, it, sorry for that background noise, but I'll just add that I know when Coast Funds went through the process of developing their um, proxy voting guidelines that they wanted to ensure aligned with the broader um, values and vision uh, and um, uh, of Coast Funds, that it certainly was a journey that was accompanied with their service providers, with their investment consultant, with their investment manager. Um, so they, you know, went on that, you know, they invited a process and and you know they the people they worked with were, you know, happy to get on board and be a part of it. So, um, you know, in, I, I think that um, you know many many asset managers and consultants are really keen and they have a huge amount of resources and knowledge that they can contribute to that. One of the questions that's come through here that uh, is a good one is um, ideas on how to make the values more prevalent in trust meetings so they are always present at the table uh, and I think that's a great question because you know you can articulate this in your investment policy statement and it stays there and it's, it's not alive in uh, the ongoing governance of the trust. So ideas uh, from any of you on, on how a trust might incorporate that much more intentionally into you know, all of the conversations. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in on that one if you don't mind. Um, you know, however a community would uh, open a gathering of any kind, uh, the trustees would, can, can incorporate that. I think you know when we initially started with the TOA, we were really relying on the input we got from our service providers, you know, and they were giving us the generic, you know, here's how you operate a trust, here's how you operate investment. But as we really started to think about how, but these are very personal or community-related uh, entities, and and a lot more of our own personality from our community in the form of the values. And, and cultural values and traditional values need to, needed to come out. And once we start doing that, then we can impart that on the people who we work with, uh, who will get a better, you know, again, get a better understanding of why they're working for us. Um, you know, because, I, it, you know, for example, a, 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 I'm sure a religious uh, board would, would open up with a prayer. And, you know, we, we do that as well. Uh, and I think when, when the, those who are non-Indigenous or from outside our community are participating in that very powerful thing. So I would include your traditional and your cultural um, values and, and openings and procedures into the meeting sessions. And I think that goes a long way to, to help the people working with you understand who you are. Mike? I just add a, add a couple of points. Um, I think, you know the the structure of your of your trust board and your trustees you know should be you know as 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 well as possible be be reflective of your community so that you have as broad of perspectives as possible that can speak to the different aspects of uh, the different perspectives from your community whether it be uh, you 
youth representatives or or um, or elder representatives that can speak firsthand in, in a very practical way their their thoughts on relative, relative to um, how the trust is performing and I think I touched on a little bit in my introductory comments about not just having quantitative uh, reviews of your your trust performance but also having giving some uh, allowing time to have sort of, I guess qualitative uh, discussions about the performance of the trust to make sure that um, everyone is comfortable with with uh, what is being invested and, and where it's being invested um, is I think you know the, the the more direct way you can cr draw a line between your community's values and those measures uh, that are reviewed on a on a regular basis the the, the better chance you have of ensuring there's an, an alignment between your community's values and 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 your your the the wealth that you're managing. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Mike, in terms of um, thinking about the um, measuring some of those broader impacts. And I do know um, you know uh, of some trusts that are actually going through a process to try to understand the broader impacts of the trust in their community. There's a way to do that, obviously, on the disbursement side, but there's also ways to do that on the investment side. And certainly we know that some managers are starting to be asked, as, as Mark said, by other uh, clients about, you know, the impact measurement of their investments. So looking at impacts on, you know, some people use the sustainable development goals. Um, I know, um, for example, Raven Indigenous Capital Partners has a very, very sophisticated impact and measurement tool that is designed by um, the communities and the entrepreneurs that they're supporting themselves. So it's very um, uh, uh, evaluation that's very Indigenous led. So I think these are really important points and certainly um, ways that that in Indigenous investors can think about measuring those broader impacts. Um, another question that has come through, um, a recommendation that I think is a great one, um, uh, is can we do an information session with trusts, either together or individual trusts, um, who might want to jump into the offer of participating in the Values in Action program, uh, uh, again, uh, free for uh, one year, and absolutely, if folks on the phone are interested and want to hear more information, please reach out and we can do um, a presentation much like this, but with um, your uh, uh, whole board or um, you know anyone who needs to be on that call from, from your um, trust. And so we can do that. We could also do just an informational session, um, Katie, where anybody could come and, and participate to hear more about it. Um, and that would likely at this point be sort of later in August, uh, early September, but that is something um, that absolutely we would love to tell you more about this opportunity. Um, uh, and so um, please reach out again um, if you're interested and, and we can set that up and, and we may also just invite uh, a, an informational session on that. Uh, so that's a great idea, thank you. Um, and, and I don't think I see any other questions. Um, we're just coming to the end of the hour. I'm just looking if anyone has their hands up. I don't see any hands up here. Um, Mike, and did you want a last word? Oh, I'm not sure I want to be the last word, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one thought that came to mind, you know, as we're talking about um, uh, the governance and, and management of our trusts and ensuring that our values are uh, incorporated. I think it's also at a practical level too in, in, in putting together your investment strategy. I think what I found is, you know, there is there's a real distinction between us First Nation as investors versus sort of the mainstream institutional investors. And so I think we want to avoid conversations with potential asset managers that treat us as just institutional investors, because we have some, you know, aside from the value values side of things, which you know, may be unique to to us, we also 
especially here in BC, I don't want to speak for the rest of Canada, but you know, we're in a lot of ways we're we're a work in progress. You know, we have uh, X amount of funds that we're setting aside for investment, but as communities work through the formal recognition of title and rights, that's going to bring about more wealth. And um, our our the, the nature, size, scope of the assets that we're going to have under management is hopefully going to evolve over time, and we're going to be we're going to be in a different place three, five, ten years from now. And so we need to have plans in place. We need to consider plans that recognize that, that we will, we are an evolving in, investor. And I think it also plays out both on the, well, in terms of the assets under manage, management, but also where and how are the funds that are being generated are being used. And so I guess I would just recommend to the, to the, to the groups that are at, at that place and <clears throat> in terms of a, putting a plan in place is to factor in the consideration that their situation now may not be the situation that they're going to be in in five years time. Great, I just had a request to show the first slide. Um, and so this is the very first slide. Um, and I'm not sure if this is the one that you wanted to see. So I'm just going to slowly um, click through here and maybe Katie, you can just close us off. Um, sure. Yeah, we are back at the top, the top of the hour. Um, but if there are any further questions, if you want to talk more about how this material and these ideas um, relate to your own trust, to your own community's investments, or how you might think about implementing them um, and taking some of the, these ideas and running with them, we would really welcome you to reach out to any of us here. Um, the Reconciliation and Responsible Investment Initiative really is designed to um, support and to help you along in this journey wherever you might be along it. So same goes if you are, say, an asset manager who is interested in embedding discussion of these strategies with um, trustee boards, um, we would welcome that as well. Um, and if you want to read the full guide that we have been discussing today, it's available on our website at reconciliationinvestment.ca. Um, you can also find us on Twitter and you can sign up on our website for our listserv too to get the latest, latest news and releases. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers today for helping to bring this material to life as well as to the many contributors to the guide that form the basis of this programming. Thank you to the sponsors too who helped make this work possible and thank you um, all of us for all of you for joining us today especially in this um, summer heat we look forward to supporting you and to talking about this further and just one final thing we will send the full slide deck out to everybody who registered so that you'll have access to each of the slides and hopefully um, that will help um, I, you see in more detail the, the different slides thank you Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody.